All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and get started. So today's presentation is the power of model prep. This is all about using our tools in the model prep tab to modify our solids without using any solid history. We actually did a sister presentation to this a couple of uh, months ago called The Power of Solid History, I believe. And that was all about the tools in the solids tab uh, that allow us to modify and, and make our models and then tools that you can use to make modification of those solids easier and more automatic in programming. So this is very similar to that presentation, except for we're really focusing on the model prep tools. Um, we're going to have several points to go over today. The, we're going to talk about why you might want to go in the route of model prep versus solid history. So we're going to kind of go back and forth on those a little bit and kind of explain the pros and cons and why they're just kind of a little bit different from each other. Not one is better than the other necessarily. It's It really comes down to a few factors that uh, may make a difference for you. Uh, we need to talk about workflow considerations for just a second as well and, and kind of a good practice that you can use moving forward. Uh, and then we're going to get right into the tools themselves. So we're going to talk about how we can remove or modify our fillets. Um, we can use the push pull tool, which is an awesome tool. I probably use that more than anything else uh, to change our solid faces by moving them directly. Uh, we can also talk about moving features in entirety, uh, which is really neat. I have a couple of cool examples for that. Uh, then we're going to talk about holes because holes are a big deal. Uh, so we're going to talk about how we can remove them, how we can fill them, how we can modify them using these model prep tools. Uh, another one we're going to go over is removing thread detail, which is a pretty big one. Um, there is definitely some stuff going on with thread detail these days and the engineers who get very overzealous with their designs. Uh, and then we're going to wrap this up with talking about how we can add history back into our model, particularly for holes, because that's really where history shines uh, for this kind of modeling. So uh, this would lead us into the question of why you would want to use model prep tools over solid tools, why you might need to or why you might want to. So the difference between model prep and solid tools is that solid tools will use history. And so that's what we went over in the last presentation, or not the last one, the one before that. <laughs> and it has to do with keeping track of a, a linear list of things that happen to a solid model to turn it into what it is now. Model prep does not use that. Model prep is a direct editing tool, meaning that you simply directly modify the faces on the solid live in real time. And this is really cool because it allows you a little bit more flexibility and freedom in the way you want to change your solid model. So you might want to do this or you might need to use these tools if you don't have any existing solid history. Uh, let's say that the file that you get is just a step file. That's not going to have any history associated with it, which means if you need to modify that model, you don't really have an option to just change the history in a lot of cases. Um, this might also be the case if you don't really have an equivalent solid history based tool. Um, so for instance, if you're just modifying a fillet, you know, you could do that with solid history or model prep. There's ways to do it um, both ways. Um, but there are other features uh, that you may not have in, sol in the, the regular solid tools, such as if you need to take a solid face and split it in a certain spot, that's not something that you could easily do with a solid tool. There are ways to get it done, but it's definitely easier with model prep. And finally, this might come down to some preference. Ultimately, what I love about Mastercam is that Hardly ever is there only one way to get something done. There's usually at least two ways to do anything. And so this gives you another route for how you want to work with your solid models in Mastercam. Now, this also is kind of the other side of the, the question, right? Why would you want to keep your history? There's a few things in Mastercam that you do need history in order to do. Um, so for instance, one of the things we talked about in that previous presentation was using the stop op option. Uh, if you take a look here, and I don't have my pointer on, let me take my pointer. There we go. So this stop op at the bottom here of your solid history tree, we actually talked about how you can move that within your solid history tree to ignore certain features and then make tool paths based on that point in the solid history. And that's really powerful. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with that depending on your model and what you want to do. But 
uh, if you're removing your history, that becomes basically useless, right? It doesn't work that way because what when you don't have history, it's just looking at the model as it sits. So there's one thing you would lose. Uh, additionally, hole making toolpaths. If you are using whole segments with your uh, hole making toolpaths, then again, that's something where you're going to need history in order to use those functions. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't have a segment to hold on to. And then another reason is you, you don't have any access to the solid patterning tools when you don't have history behind it. Uh, so that can also be a bit of a detriment in some cases, especially if you have like repeating patterns of certain features. It's really nice to have that solid history for quick edits to, you know, family of parts and things like that. Um, now, there are maybe more reasons why you might want to keep your solid history. These were kind of the top three in my mind when I was putting this together. All right, so last slide before we get into Mastercam, I promise. Uh, so one thing we might want to consider in terms of our workflow is we need to keep sort of a gold standard for our modeling. And so when we are using these model prep tools, especially if, you know, if we're getting our model in from another source, we want to make sure we keep our original. So an easy way for us to do this is to get the, get the original model and then save that to a level that you're not going to touch. What that level is is up to you. Maybe you want to put that on level one. Maybe you want to put it on level 10,000, right? You can do whatever you like here, but it's recommended that you take that original and put it on a level so that it's safe. Then you can make a copy of that model, put it on a different level and call that your machining model. That way you can always turn them both on and compare the two and make sure that any of the changes that you made aren't going to negatively affect your final outcome. It can sometimes be easy to forget where exactly you are in the process. And so you want to make sure that you have something to compare with. Now, that's not to say that the model that you get is always perfect. Um, I've definitely seen this in the past where the model that I get is not actually what I need. The print is always the boss. Right. The, the model is a nice thing to have when it comes to programming, but ultimately the print is the real, real standard. Um, but it is nice to have that comparison tool available to us. OK, so let's get started. Um, we're going to start with the modify fillet tool and the remove fillet tool. These are both tools in our model prep tab that allow us to change fillets in our parts. Now, again, these have direct correlation to other solid tools that use history. But if you don't have any history, then this is the easiest way to go about modifying any fillets in your part. So let's check it out. OK, so this is the model we're going to start with here, and we have a bunch of different fillets on this part. We have some at the top on the inside and outside. We have a couple at the bottom of this pocket out here, this one here in the bottom of this little cross shape. And then there's also some fillets on the outside of this part for our profile. So the way that we modify these fillets with our model prep tools is to use the modify fillet button right here. So model prep, modify fillet. So this is an extremely simple uh, tool. There's not much to it. We have one field in our basic tab and we have one field in our advanced tab, which is just automatically preview, which I always have on because it makes it a little easier to, to work with. So in order to modify a fillet, we need to select them. And if you're, if you're not used to using this, we do have this menu up here and this is available on pretty much every function and it gives you options for how you make your selections. It's important that you take a look at this because you may not remember all of it, and it can be really useful, especially when you're dealing with a large number of features that are similar. So our options include shift click to select adjacent fillet faces or control click to select all fillet faces with a matching radius. So um, let's say that I want to kind of modify all of the fillets in this area. If I tried to do a control click, You'll see that it's actually going to pick up pretty much everything except for our profile fillets. And I don't necessarily want to do that. So I'm going to hit escape to get out of that and reopen it. Instead, if I wanted to modify, let's say this one here, and then as well as some others, I would want to go in and select them more carefully. So um, we can use like a shift click. That usually gets around some of them. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong feature. That's modified feature. I want modify fillet. There we go. 
So a shift click will get us kind of all of our tangencies, everything that's kind of lined up together just like that. Maybe I want this bottom one as well. I'm going to leave the ones on the top off because we're going to do something different with that. And now it shows the radius here and I might pick something a little bit bigger like 0625 and we'll see how it beefed all of those up. All right. So that's pretty cool. Now, one thing I also want to point out is if we use modify fillet again, if I select this one and one that does not match, they will suddenly match, right? So if you're picking things of different sizes, you are then telling them that they now have to be the same size. So this isn't an incremental change. This is an absolute change. Okay. So that's a quick and easy way to modify those fillets. Now let's talk about kind of the top edges here. Uh, I might be in a situation where those fillets are not actually needed as far as their geometry. Maybe it's just done to make it look nice. This needs to be edge broken or something like that. I'd rather hit this with a chamfer tool and just kind of roll around it quickly. Um, it's a little easier to use than a round over tool. And I think it you know, is generally a little easier to program. So in a case like that, I might go in here and use the remove fillets tool. And so for this one, um, one thing that I've noticed about it is that it's it's generally has the same rules in terms of using shift click to get all of them. But I have noticed a couple situations where it does that automatically. So do keep that in mind. So I might select every one of these kind of top facing fillets that I would hit with a chamfer tool instead. And once I'm happy with my selection, I can just green check. And now we have a sharp edge and that makes it easier to use something like a deeper toolpath. Uh, this can also be useful if you're trying to say, you want to chain in this pocket and you know that there's going to be a fillet here because you're going to hit this with a bull end mill, but it's easier to chain off of this intersection rather than having a chain off of like the upper edge and then giving it, you know, adjusting your linking parameter to go down farther or selecting on the inner and adjusting your stock to leave. So there's always a couple ways to do things in Mastercam, uh, but this could be a little bit easier. But again, that's why it's a good idea to keep the original model on another level so you can compare. All right. Head back over to our presentation here. So the next thing I want to show you is the push pull solid face tool. This one is great. It's probably the tool that I use more than anything else in the model prep menu because it's so flexible and so easy to use. So this tool is designed to modify your features directly by just simply pushing those solid faces in any direction that you really need to. Um, th this tool also allows you to create chamfers or fillets on open solid edges, which can be really helpful if you know you you now want to bottle those back in or if you need them for some other type of toolpath. One thing I love about the push pull tool is that it doesn't care about planes. This works off of the normal of the solid face or the edge. So you don't need to worry about what construction plane am I in. And that's important, right? When we're using the solid base tools and we're using our wireframe to modify a solid model, planes become a very big deal. We need to make sure that we're in the right plane when we're, mo when we're making those modifications to wire. But this is plane agnostic, I guess you could say. <laughs> so that does make it a very useful tool. Let's check out a couple of applications for that. OK, so in this part, I'm going to use push pull to modify some of my features. And it's important to note that all of the toolpaths here are using solid edges for the chaining for those toolpaths. Um, and the reason why we really, really like that solid chaining is because it makes it associative. And if I change the model, my toolpaths update automatically. So for instance, on this piece over here, let's say that this channel needs to, you know, become a bit wider by some value. I can use my push pull tool, which is over here in my model prep menu. Select that face right there. Then click on this arrow and I can modify the size of that solid feature just by pushing it around. Because this is a radial face, I'm, give, I'm given a radius uh, ruler here. So this is an absolute change rather than an incremental change when you're on a radial face. 
And uh, let's say that this radius now needs to be 1.5. I just click it there and I'm done. You can also type in here. So I can type in, you know, one and a quarter if that's what I needed it to be. But we're going to set this back to 1.5. Now there's several other options within push pull and we don't really have time to go over those today. Um, but definitely come in and take a look at the help uh, for this because it's very useful. So the help button is found right here. That'll take you to the help page. So let's go ahead and green check here. And we'll notice that the toolpath here went dirty. And we actually have another toolpath for facing for this upper face that went dirty as well, because this face has also changed. But I can just hit regenerate and my toolpaths are done. So this can be really useful if you have like say family of parts and you have a feature that just changes in one or two directions, you can modify those quickly and on the fly with these model prep tools. Now you're not limited to a single face. Um, if we use push pull and let's say we take a look at this set of green faces here, I can select all of those faces and then click on the arrow and I can adjust them all together like this. Now on a face like this, because this is not just a single radial face, we're given an incremental ruler from here. So there is a difference in the way that these, this tool behaves depending on the geometry that you select. So if I move this in, say an eighth of an inch, that's an eighth of an inch for all faces. Once that's set, we can green check and we'll regenerate all. And there we go. New toolpath. This also works for depth. So uh, let's say I wanted to make this pocket a bit deeper. I can push pull this face down and we can move it down an extra quarter of an inch. Green check, regenerate, and there we go. Now this depth change here, this really only works if we are using uh, linking parameters that can account for that. So you're going to want to use incremental as long as your chaining is based on the bottom edge of this wall over here or use associative and pick a point. Uh, in either case, the toolpath should follow just fine. Um, associative's going to always follow it if you're picking that point based on that face. Incremental only works if you're chaining based on the an edge that matches up with this face. All right. Uh, absolute would not change. So do keep that in mind. Um, Another thing that push pull can do is change something like a hole size, which we're actually going to go over in a bit. Um, but it's important to note that if you were to push pull this hole, uh, which I have op to is a drilling operation here. And right now, if I analyze this, that is three quarters of an inch. So if this hole got changed to a different value and I use push pull to change that size, the model will update, but this does not update your tool. Right. Very important to know that um, no effect on your tool. You will need to go back into your toolpath, select a different tool and, you know, make sure your speeds and feeds are good. Check your tip comp, your linking parameters and all that stuff. Right. So push pull just kind of on a, on a really on a basic level is such a flexible and powerful tool. Now there's another tool in here called move, and this allows you to actually take a feature and move its position on the model. And again, because we're using those solid chains for our toolpath, we can automatically update our toolpaths based on that new position. So again, family of parts, this can really shine if you have a feature that might just move to different positions. So let's take a look back in Mastercam here. The first one I want to start with is uh, this post back here, uh, which is operation seven. So right now, the way that this is chained in, if we take a look at our geometry, our machining region is here. So it's kind of the uh, inside edge of that pocket, just like that. And then we're using an avoidance region to avoid that post. So if this post gets moved because we're using that solid, then again, the toolpath can update. So if we use direct editing over here, move, we can select our feature. Now it's important the way that you select the faces for move. If you have a face like this that is completely encapsulated 
by this face out here, then you don't have to select it. But if it's not completely encapsulated, you may need to select it. Um, so if you're not getting the result you're looking for, or if you're getting the little yellow warning error in the upper right corner, take a look at your selection and try a couple different things to get the result that you're looking for. So in this case, uh, you know, maybe this post in a different version of this part sits half an inch farther back. Green check, regenerate, and we're done. So that is really, really powerful and a very fast way of modifying our programs for different part shapes um, or different positions, right? Another thing to keep in mind here is let's say that not only am I going to move this and we're going to move this one like, I don't know, an inch, but you also have a copy option. So if you use that copy option, if we regenerate, it's not going to account because it's take it's basically taken this and used this one as the original chain, but you can just come back into your geometry and add another avoidance pretty easily to the bottom there. And then it will get around both of those. So there is a little bit of rechaining to do if you're having to copy features around, but it's still pretty fast and easy and definitely easier than having to get a whole new model or rebuilding something. Now let's take a look at this feature over here, this kind of finger that's poking into this pocket. Um, if I wanted to move this, I do need to be careful about the way I make my selection. So I'm going to go into move and I want to pick the faces to move. And in this case, I need to go basically from this fillet all the way around to the other fillet. And you can manually select these if you want to, but if you've got a good way to kind of just window select it like this, then you can select them all pretty easily. Notice that it's not selecting the top face here. And that's because the window that I selected did not encapsulate the whole face, but that's okay because in this case, if I were to shift this around, I shouldn't have a problem. For some reason, it's not liking what I'm picking here. So let me try that one more time. Oops, here we go. Oh, you know what? It's giving me a warning because I'm set to copy, I think. Yep, there we go. Yeah, copy and move, they're different. <laughs> so copy only works on freestanding features. If you have something connected to walls, it does not like that. So I can now move the position of this along the wall. Let's say we'll move it a half inch this way, green check and regenerate just like everything else. Um, if I do that again, let's see, this time I'm going to use my window selection now that I know the problem that I had. <laughs> Not only can we move it along this wall this way, but I could actually extend this out this way as well. Now, I am probably going to have some clearance issue there, so I won't go that far. But you know, you can just extend that pretty easily. You can also take uh, this little red ball here and I can reference another point. So if I know that it has to be a distance from that point, I can measure it that way. So don't forget about the really powerful tools you have within your dynamic gnomon to set reference points. Just regenerate like that. Now, can you move, can you use the move command for Z? Well, that's a little bit more interesting. See, if I wanted to do that, so we'll select all the same faces again. And then I would also need to include the top here. Now, if I use Z, it sort of acts like push pull. Right? The problem is if I try to now go side to side, I, I may get some weird results with this. Um, and then also, if you only wanted to change the height of this area here, this is where we'll need a different tool called split solid face, which is right next to move. Uh, so I would select this top face to split and I'm using the flow line option here because I don't have any wireframe and you flow line tends to uh, run the way I need it to. And then I would just need to snap that to something to break this face up and then green check. Now I have a separate face. So now I could use move to shift this around, but keep in mind also that the order of the operations for this is important. Um, oops, I'll click that. I can move this around this way and this way, but notice that if I tried to do my Z first and then I tried to move it in Y, 
in the upper right corner, I don't know if I can click it, there we go, I'm getting this warning message saying that we're having a problem locating the geometry for our edge. So if you want to do that, just try a different order of operations. Try doing x, y first before z, or vice versa, depending on the geometry situation. It does make a difference to it. Or alternatively, just use push-pull and push that down. And now I have a different face. Of course, I need to add a toolpath here, but you know that's relatively easy. So the move is really powerful uh, for moving a feature like that. You can use it to move a hole. Uh, and one thing that's pretty cool about this is because I'm using my solid hole for both the drilling operation and the air region for my dynamic, that means if I were to come in here and use move to shift this hole over a bit like that, both of those operations will go dirty and they will both get updated correctly. So solid chaining. It's really, really important if you want to be using these tools, um, but very powerful. And I like that a lot. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is how we can remove, fill, or modify holes in our parts. Um, and so the reason we might want to do something like modifying our holes is because it can help us simplify our programming in some scenarios. Uh, you might have a scenario like the one I'm showing here, where you have a hole in a face, but because of that hole, it makes it a little trickier to toolpath off of. You might think I need to build a surface or something, but there are ways around that by using a simple tool in model prep to fill up that hole and make it a nice, easy, uh, clean piece to machine. Uh, you can also just simply remove holes if they're not relevant. You can adjust positions. Uh, again, model prep, being able to adjust all of these features kind of on the fly is what makes it so powerful. So let's take a look at that example. Okay, so um, in this example here, we do have a bolt pattern out here. So if this bolt pattern needs to move, we can use the move tool to move them. Again, make sure you're checking this menu right here, because rather than selecting every single hole here, what I could do is look at this and see that if I control click a single hole face, that will select all of the holes with matching diameters. So that makes it very easy for me to select all of those at once and shift the entire bolt pattern around. So again, family of parts types things where you have the same features in different locations, very powerful. Now back here, we have a hole, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off this toolpath so we can really see clearly what's happening. This is a more complex hole. Uh, we have part of it on this flat face, we have part on this fillet here, and we have part on this radial face here. So there's a lot of complex geometry going on, and extruding a cylinder into this spot does not help us get a nice smooth face over this radial face or this fillet or the flat uh, to get us something that's easy to machine on. Right? So that's where we would use the modify feature tool inside of model prep. Modify feature is like a lot of the other model prep tools, very simple. There's not a lot of options here. We can either create a body, we can remove a feature, or we can remove and create a body. So let's start with just create body here. Basically, all I need to do is select the sidewall of this hole and green check. And that creates a solid body in here. It's one solid body. You can see it's it's followed all of the curvatures here really nicely, very smooth. And it's also filled in flat on this side. So it's an intelligent tool. Um, this can do not just radial faces, but this could even do very organic shapes. It's very good at following the, the curves, the flow lines basically that make up that solid face to smooth that out very nicely. So this toolpath that we had before, um, you know, if we were to, if we were just going to like Alt E like that, okay. So I just, I hid that, it's not gone. Um, this is the original toolpath. And what this is based on, if I look at my geometry, I only selected the faces I wanted to machine and I'm trying to avoid the hole. And what we get is this toolpath that falls into the hole. You could go in there and create surfaces to try to plug it up and everything. But with that other solid that we made, just using the modify feature, we have a nice smooth engagement here. So all I need to do in my parameters is come in here and add these three faces to my selection. 
And now I have a nice smooth toolpath going over the whole area, just basically ignoring this entirely. Another thing that's kind of neat is that if we are working with a multi-axis toolpath in this kind of scenario, um, there are options for avoid holes or skip holes. Uh, but if you just add this in here, then you can use the feed control zones and only respect the area that you're trying to cut. If let's say this hole actually already exists, um, then you can still go very fast over this region if you're using a multi-axis toolpath that supports the uh, feed control zone option. So that's one way to do this. Um, and if I delete it, we're going to get an, uh, an error here saying, hey, you're deleting something that has to do with the toolpath. Put that back. Um, so other, otherwise, in Modify Feature, we also have the option to just remove it. And so this option, if we select there and say OK, we're going to get an error because that was part of our toolpath. And so we'll, we'll come in here and let's just reselect these here. This isn't something that you probably need to deal with on a daily basis. It's more of I'm playing around <laughs> and showing you stuff. So now it's like the hole's never there. And maybe that's the way that you would like to approach this. It kind of depends on your situation and your geometry. Just wanted to show you what that could do. Uh, let's say I wanted to undo that. I can go into my solids tab and oh, I guess not. Well, the the solids manager here does have an undo and redo button, and this is more tied to the model prep tools, but it doesn't work with every single one of them. Uh, it kind of depends on which tools you're using and how you're using them. Um, and I thought that was going to be there, but it's not. So in order to get back, I'd have to reopen this file. Uh, the last option in modify feature was for remove and create body, which is just doing both of those things that we already looked at. And that's, you know, if you want to have a solid representation of what that hole was, you can do that. OK, here we go. All right, so uh, we're getting close to done here. A couple of things left to do. Uh, let's talk about how we remove thread detail. Um, man, <laughs> engineers can sometimes get very eager <laughs> with their designs, and they like to put thread detail onto the part. And as a programmer, I simply have no use for that. It All it does is clog up your file. It makes it bigger. Um, having all of those additional solid edges on there does increase the size of your file. It makes it take longer to open. It makes it take longer to render toolpaths on it. Uh, it's just not that useful. So anything we can do to remove that thread detail quickly and easily is really appreciated. Uh, so we're going to talk about how to remove thread detail for external threads and internal threads. Uh, the process is a little bit different and may also depend on what you're given in terms of your own geometry. Um, I will say that in terms of render, it's really important that we get rid of this thread detail for turning operations, because when you have all of that rendered into your solid, Mastercam has to compensate for that and read that spun profile a lot when you're trying to make a toolpath or run verify. So uh, it really, really, really slows down the computer by adding in that basically useless detail. Uh, as far as, you know, like if I have internal threads on a plate or something, especially if you're milling, it's a little bit less um, intensive, but it does make an effect. And uh, in fact, the model, the one I'm going to show you, I had to pare the model down from its original size just to make it so we could have time to talk about it in this presentation and not sit here for 10 minutes waiting for it to generate. Uh, and I have a pretty strong computer. <laughs> So let's take a look at a couple of ways to modify our threads. OK, so I'm going to start with the external thread. And depending on what your geometry looks like, there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, I'm going to show you the easiest way. And that's going to be if you have a diameter back here that matches your major. Um, so if I'm looking at modifying this model to get rid of my thread detail on an external thread, I'm interested in the major diameter because that's the one that I'm going to be programming my lathe toolpath off of. And then if I am going to thread in here, you know, then I just set a thread depth and it's easy. Um, so we're sticking with major. 
So the way that I would do this with model prep is I would use push pull and I would just grab that face and I would push it back until we're clear of the thread. So all the way back to about here. Here we go. And now at this point, if I tried to pull this back out, the thread detail would actually come back because it's still in memory. So what we need to do is push it back and then use the blue check here to say OK and then uh, get ready to do the next operation. That will clear the thread detail out of memory. Then I can click on this face again and bring this back out. And then I want to go to the origin. So if I click O on my keyboard, that'll take me to origin and then I'll click enter. And now my thread detail is gone just like that. I might want to add a little chamfer up here. You can click right on the edge with push pull and that will allow you to create chamfers or fillets. Uh, so it looks like that created a fillet and I want this as a chamfer instead. So I'll just switch this to a chamfer and you can control the size by moving this arrow in and out on this ruler or you can type something in. So if I wanted this to be a 20 thousandths edge break, just type it in, hit enter twice and we're good to go. So that is the easiest way to get rid of your thread detail for an external thread. Um, if you don't have a solid face that's at the same diameter as your th thread detail, then the easier way to do this might be to simply draw a circle in wireframe and use solid extrude. Now, if you really don't want to have your history, I will point out that let's let's toss something on here just so I have an example. I will point out that if we use solid extrude, we grab that chain. Um, ask is enabled. Let's see, we'll try this from the right side. There we go. Didn't like my plane. Um, if you go to the advanced tab on these solid tools, a lot of them have a checkbox down here for do not create model history. So that actually skips the history making process and allows you to just go about your day as if it's a model prep tool. So that's another thing to consider. Um, if you do already have history, this will also eliminate any current history on the part. So do keep that in mind as well. So that's external threads. Uh, let's take a look at internal threads. This one takes a second to open uh, and it's really not that big of a part. I've only got a handful of holes in here and the original version of this was much bigger. I had about 600 of these threaded holes in the original version. This was so difficult to open. It took forever. Uh, and so I'm going to show you how to fix this, but it's a great idea to have a conversation with your engineers. If you're running into this frequently, let them know, hey, this really slows us down in production and it's unnecessary. Can you please just make these holes simple? Um, so now let's take a look at how we're going to do this. Um, you'll notice that I have some wireframe drawn up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use solid extrude. I'm just not going to have any history with it. Um, and the way that I got that wireframe, there's not actually a great way for me to say, draw a circle, you know, here, because my whole axis doesn't like to work with threaded holes. I don't have a solid edge to use curve one edge, anything like that. So really the only way to get this done is to know the dimensions and have a reference point. So I happen to have that, which is why I can have this wireframe here, but you should have that as long as you have a print, right? I have two circles drawn here. The first one is a circle that just needs to be at least the major diameter of the thread. You could make it a little bit bigger. It's not really going to make a difference. The smaller hole here or the smaller circle, um, you could draw this at the minor diameter, which is ultimately what I want out of this part. But one thing to keep in mind is that depending on how this was modeled, it, that may not be quite right. This is a quarter 20 hole. And if I zoom in here, this circle is only barely smaller than the modeled hole. But if I measure this, uh, this is at 0.2. Quarter 20 holes, mo uh, the, the minor diameter would be 207. That's what you would tap drill at. So I actually had to go a little bit undersized in this model because those threads were drawn with an extra small minor. That's okay if we're not right on size here. I'm going to show you how we change that later. 
So the next thing to do is figure out how to basically get rid of this thread detail using this. And the way that I've been doing this is I'll use my extrude tool. Go ahead and chain both of those in. And rather than adding this as a boss, I'm actually going to create this as a body. And I'm going to uh, set our distance down to the bottom of the part and create that body. And then we don't need to have any solid history with this, so we can just say OK. Now, I have something that essentially just gets rid of all of that uh, feature if we combine them, but I have all these other holes too. So what I'll do is I'll select my newly created solid right here, and then we'll go back in the top view. Under my Transform menu, I have Rectangular Array, and this allows you to pattern out uh, on your screen, and you can use wireframe, solid surface, anything you like. I've, this is already preset because I was working with this earlier, but all you really need to do is set the distance between the holes and how many instances. Uh, you might also notice there's a couple in here where holes don't actually exist. I'm not going to worry about that. It's not going to affect anything here. So if I green check, I now have all these extra solids, and then I'm just going to go to my solids tab and use Boolean to Boolean these together. So my plate is my target. My tool bodies are based on all of those plugs, so I'm just going to window select everything. It's going to take a second to process that, and then we're good. Do not create model history and green check. OK, and there we go. So now all of our holes have no detail left to them. So that's beautiful. And at this point, I need to talk about the next tool in our presentation before we can finish this up. So one thing that you may want to do in some scenarios, especially in something like this, you may want to add your solid history back into your model. And at a minimum, I'd say for holes. There are a couple of tools in Mastercam that allow us to add history back in. We have add history and find holes. Uh, those are two separate functions that do a similar thing. It's just that find holes is specifically for holes and add history is for extrusions and fillets. I don't find those to be as useful, uh, but having the whole history there is really great because it gives us flexibility to change things on larger scales and make it easier to add toolpaths. Uh, it's also going to be required to have solid history to do a couple things. If you want to use whole segments, you need solid history. If you're going to import your drill operations, it's a really good idea to have some solid history. And new for 2024, really excited about this, we have a new uh, toolpath called Process Hole. And we're not going to talk about that today, but I do want to let you know that is super exciting. We are going to be going over that in June. So make sure that you guys are on our newsletter and, uh, and getting that so that you can get signed up for that webinar. It's going to be awesome. So uh, let's go ahead and jump back into Mastercam and we'll wrap this up. So at this point, I have my solid, no history. I don't even need this wireframe anymore. I can just delete that. And I want to add the whole history back in. So I'm going to go to my model prep tab and we're going to go to find holes. Now, it's kind of funny because this is a model prep tool, but it's for adding history, which is a little confusing. Maybe I mean, I might expect that on the solids tab, um, but, you know, it's kind of how you think about it, I guess. This tool is fairly easy to use. Uh, there's actually a great set of videos on streamingteacher.com that cover this really in depth. So if you want to learn more about this, you can go watch those. Uh, but essentially, I have one solid body on screen, so it's been pre-selected. I'm going to ask it to create whole operations and create a single operation, which doesn't mean we have one solid history item. It means that for every whole size, we're going to have one history item. And that's great for modifying holes on a larger scale. So if I green check here, it's going to find 61 holes in one body. And now if I go to my solids manager, I have three simple holes inside of the history. So now remember that hole, the minor diameter was undersized. I can now double click on this and change this to 207 where I expect it to be and then hit the blue check. And now those holes measure at 207. So if I F4, check, we're going to see 207. So now if you're using, uh, you know, any of the any of the automatic 
options in Mastercam for drilling, um, or if you're going to be using, say, process hole, which I'm pretty excited about, um, you need those holes to be a correct size in order to use some of those processes. And that's a quick and easy way to modify all of your holes. So the model prep tools, while I could have gone in there and used push pull, it's it's not quite as flexible as using something like a solid history based tool uh, like the hole feature. So there's always a couple of ways to do things in Mastercam, and I hope that after seeing this, you have a better understanding and a greater appreciation for how this software works and the different ways that you can do things.